All right, we're back. I have another letter here to answer. This is initials C R Y, first, middle, last, from Brandon M S. I think that's Mississippi. I think. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, okay. And uh, got a letter here to read. Uh, like three pages, I guess. My name is C R L Y. Um, I was born on March 24th, 1987, in Houston, Texas. To my parents, um, R A C Y and P A G L Y. Lots of names there. <laughs> um, Renee was a Latino from Panama and Central America who came from a wealthy family of civil engineers. Um, P, I said the name there, but you aren't going to get the full thing there, is a white lady who came from a wealthy family of businessmen who were from Ireland and England and Scotland. When I was three years old, my parents divorced and my mother and I moved to Brandon, Mississippi, where my grandmother, L-A-G-L, -L, lived. My, we became members of the Episcopal Church that my grandmother was a member of. My grandmother was born into an Episcopal Episcopalian family of multiple generations that dated back... Um, this is hard to read this one, uh, dated back maybe to her grandparents. My mom was brought up as an Episcopalian, so I was brought up as one too. My grandmother had divorced my mom's father, T.L., and was married to a man, my grandfather, though not by blood, named J.R. I called him Papa J. My mother and grandmother had me baptized at the church at the age of three, and my grandmother and grandfather became my grand godparents. I started learning Bible stories at a young age from a Bible picture book that Papa J would read to me. My favorite stories were David and Goliath and Jesus walking on the water. I was four years old at the time. Papa J would take me fishing and let me drive his little pickup truck while sitting on his lap, sometimes even letting me drive around the sharp curves on the interstate in Jackson, the capital city 10 minutes away from where we live. He also liked to take me to his church, First Baptist Church in Jackson. But I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and needless to say, I never learned anything. All they do there is ceremonial rituals, no life at all, just a dead church. Absolutely no spiritual growth whatsoever. Not an exaggeration, well, I'm sure. Well, I grew up in a small neighborhood that was just being built, so me and, and my one or two friends used to go play in the houses that were under construction. Over the years, we got to play in, well, however many houses got built. We fished, swam, rode bikes, played video games, typical 90s kids. I went to high school, played soccer, and ran track and cross country and graduated in 2005. By that time, I was smoking and drinking, had been sneaking out and disobeying my parents' rules, was messing around with girls, and so on. My mother had remar remarried a man named B.C.H., a policeman, in 1994. I called him Dad. So I went on to community college since I could play soccer there and be close to home since I had a girlfriend who was still in high school. The soccer coach convinced me um, that they had two full years of courses for my civil engineering degree. It had been determined before I was even born, I think, that I would grow up to be a civil engineer since it was the family profession. But as it turned out, he lied, and they only had one year of classes at the local campus. By this time, it was 2006, and I was heavy into drugs and alcohol and fornication. My world was full of darkness, absolutely no light to speak of, and it had been that way since I could even, could even remember. I remember the last time I felt okay was when I was f about five years old. The conditions at home with BNP were completely, or complicated to put it lightly. My mom was a drunkard and stepdad was a violent policeman. He had been uh, divorced a couple of times already and had a history of beating up his wife and children and he continued that tradition when he got my mom pregnant and married her. My mom had divorced R because he was a drug addict. So I had to go to another location at the, of the community college in a town called Goodman, Mississippi to finish my second year of courses, and I really didn't care whether I lived or died at this point. I was 19 and the school was an hour from home. I absolutely hated going there. That year was by far the worst year I had ever experienced. Everything went wrong, and I had an overdose that changed my life. Um, I still suffer the effects of that decision to this day, and I'm 33 years old now. Basically, I took some ecstasy that was laced the night after New Year's Eve. I drank a case of beer the night before, 
and um, then took the ecstasy while being extremely dehydrated and it almost killed me. I should have died, but didn't. That was the last time I took ecstasy. Scared me to death. Praise the Lord. Some people are just real dumb and hard-headed and have to be dealt with in such a way to get them to stop doing things that are bad for them. So since I was now dealing with a, a new life, so to speak, having to deal with living with the effects of an overdose, I stopped caring about school. I went on to Mississippi State University and lived with my friends I grew up with. I wasn't using drugs, but I wasn't going to class either. I was just a deadbeat selling drugs for money. I dropped out of college and came back home and continued my illegal business until the police got hot on my trail. They were parking outside of where I was living, which was in some apartments behind the, the high school, and were stopping people who came out after buying. Some guy robbed me around that time. Things were obviously still really dark. I had started doing drugs again and was addicted worse than before. Then out of the blue, Renee called me. I have no idea how he got my phone number, but when he called, I recognized his voice immediately. The last time I had seen or heard him was when I was five years old. He asked if I wanted to come live with him in Panama. I looked outside at the police cars and said, yes, without hesitation. A couple of months later, I was living in Panama City, Panama, at my grandparents' house. I have dual citizenship since my dad is from that country. I started learning Spanish and got to know my dad's side of the family. I stayed clean for almost two months. My dad relapsed and then I relapsed. He became homeless and I got kicked out of my grandparents' house. I lived in Panama from 2011 to 2012. In May of 2012, R, well, Renee, I already said the name, sorry, died of a heart attack from the crack cocaine he was using. I gave a speech at his funeral in English and Spanish in which I confessed my first genuine belief in the existence of God. I reasoned that of all the things that had happened uh, were too many coincidences to just blame coincidence, um, that there must be a supreme being. I didn't know God, but I believed he existed. Typical pagan lifestyle. I came back home to Mississippi and picked up right where I left off. I was addicted to drugs, deep in darkness and depression, and spent the next four or five years sleeping during the day and playing computer games. I can relate to the computer games, not to the drugs, but computer games are just mess you up at night. There. Playing computer games at night, letter says. I would go for days without eating because I just didn't care. There were some years that where I never saw the light of day, so finally I decided I was going to kill myself. I had nothing to live for. I ruined everything. That was 2017. In desperation, I made a last-ditch effort to look for help. I talked to my mom. She had nothing to offer. I talked to my grandmother. Same thing. Nothing. They sent me to the priest lady at the Episcopal Church. Same thing. Nothing. I remember one day being in church and during the service at the time when the little assembly of robed clergy women walk into the congregation with a stick with a gold cross on top of it and the gospel book to read the gospel, the people would bow to the gold cross as it went by. I became overwhelmingly aware that those people were not worshiping the true God and it scared me more than I can explain. But my mom and grandmother made me talk with the priest lady to see if she could help me with my problems. I had already searched in Google for help. I typed something like, I want to kill myself, what should I do? I found that everybody was advising to pray and read the Bible and go to church. So the first question I asked uh, Carol Mead, I'll just say her name, the devil priest witchcraft lady, <laughs> when I met with her was how long she has been studying Christianity. She corrected me and said she has been studying Episcopalianism for 14 years. I immediately went home and searched what is the difference between Christianity and Episcopalianism. I found out that they aren't even Christians. They're not, exactly. The Episcopalians are not saved. So my search for truth began. She also gave me a really thick NIV to help me, one that was made by 100 of the greatest scholars and had commentary and whatever else in it. It was one of those uh, two-year chronologies I looked in my closet and saw that I already had 11 Bibles in there. Must have been a lot of times over the years when people said, here, you need to read this. Laugh out loud. Every single one of my Bibles was NIV. So I started reading the NIV and found that the wisdom I had been searching for needed so desperately was within the pages of that book. Only problem was I didn't understand it and didn't know how to. 
how to pray. Um, but I knew I had found what I was looking for. So I quit my job. I got a job as a courier at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson. But I quit and started reading the Bible full time and asked God to please help me to understand what I was reading. I begged God to let me in the door. For months and months I sat outside God's door and knocked and begged to come in. I got no answer, no relief. Read Proverbs chapter 1 verses 22 through 33. The problem was my heart was so bad that I was blocking myself from believing the very thing I needed to believe, the gospel message. I knew I didn't believe, but I literally had no other option. I just kept asking God to help me believe that I want to believe, but I don't. I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. I had to believe in Jesus, but I just didn't. After praying and reading the NIV for about nine months, I concluded from I concluded that what it meant to be a true Christian was to sell everything I owned and go preach the gospel on the streets. I'd quit drugs and alcohol for the most part, but was still smoking cigarettes. Only problem was, <clears throat> I didn't even know what the gospel really was. I knew Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the gospels, but I didn't know what the gospel was. So I sold everything and took a bus to Atlanta to go be a, to go be a street preacher. That was January of 2018, and my family was distraught. They thought I had truly lost my mind and that they might never see me again. All I took was a backpack with a few things in it. There was a blizzard that year down south, so we had snow, which is rare. It was zero degrees, and I was in Atlanta by 10.30ish p.m. It took like 12 hours to get there and cost like $110. So as soon as I got off the bus, a tall black man approached me from the street saying, I'm a God-fearing man. I'm a God-fearing man. That was the first time I'd ever heard anybody in real life say those words to me. And I was there to preach the gospel, so he caught my attention. He walked up and tried to sell me some gloves. I didn't want them. He asked what I was doing there, so I told him. He said to me, you're blind. He said, go back inside and don't come back outside unless you see me again. I didn't see him again. His name was Ali. So I spent the night at the bus station in Atlanta and bought a ticket to Mississippi. Ali's words cut straight to my heart. Nobody has ever told me I was blind, blind like Ali did. He might have been an angel, but I'm not sure. So I came back home and continued my search for the truth, but this time much more humbly. As soon as I got back, my grandmother became very ill. One night with, when my mom and brother went to go help her get to the hospital, I read the entire book of Romans while I waited on them to come back. She couldn't catch her breath because of congestive heart failure, so they had to take her to the fire department to get some oxygen and then to the hospital. A couple days later, I came across Mike Pearl on YouTube. He has a series of videos on the book of Romans. As I watched this, the episode on Romans chapter 7, the gospel message clicked. I understood and finally believed. Some people are just dumb and need more than others. I asked Jesus to save me, and he answered this time. I believed and asked him, and he heard me. I found out where the, about the Bible version issue. I threw away all of the NIVs and books of common prayer and along with some other occultic books and I took a hammer and busted out all, all of the TVs in the house. I went to the bookstore and bought everybody in my family a King James Bible. They thought I was nuts. They were all against me. I came across Clarence Larkin, Peter Ruckman, David Daniels, Charles Lawson, and you. I also came across some other people like Rick Warren, John MacArthur, Francis Chan, S.M. Lockridge, Elias Alistair Begg, uh, Tony Evans, Jimmy Swagger, etc. It took some time to tell the difference. It was kind of one deception after another, but with time, God has been straightening out my beliefs, and I thank Him all the time for it. In conclusion, ever since that Holy King James Bible entered into the house I grew up in, where I am currently sitting writing this letter, the Lord has been moving graciously in my life and in my family's lives. There's no doubt about it. The King James Bible has power. Nine months straight of reading the NIV, nothing but confusion couple of videos with God's actual words and somebody helping to explain them who has God's Holy Spirit of life and truth born again. Pretty big difference. My grand grandmother gave up her childhood religion and got born again about a week before she died at the age of 88 thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ and the King James Bible. I also got to care for my grandmother before she died um, and I learned a lot. I had just gotten saved and the timing of that was perfect. My mom got saved too, and now I'm still at home. I got fired about a month ago for preaching the gospel at work, and I've been ministering to my family and friends and neighbors as the Spirit of God leads me. I'm not perfect, not even close, 
but I've been off of drugs for about two years. I quit smoking and drinking. My taste in music changed. I used to listen to radio music when I was a kid, then rap, classic rock, modern rock, heavy metal, and then reggae. Now I listen to classic music and hymns. Laugh out loud. I like bluegrass too, always have. I really don't even have the desire for the things I used to. It's the born-again process there. God has blessed me, brother. <clears throat> he gave me a new heart of flesh when I thought it was broken and unfixable and never able to love again. He renewed my mind, which is why... Which, which I was ready to blow out because I thought it was past the point of fixing. But he created for us a purpose, and he knew us before we were even born. He wants us to learn about him and to get to know him and to help other people meet him. He is a wonderful God, so much higher than all of the evil and darkness and sin and death the world and Satan has to offer. Jesus loves us and is jealous of what we set our hearts on. If it's not on him, it's he's jealous. Paul's story tells... Paul's story really helped me to understand that our Heavenly Father will forgive even the worst of us. He loves us, and without a doubt, He is coming again to take us with Him. I've learned a lot from you over the past couple of years. Keep up the good work and know that I think highly of you and that you're in my prayers. God is still working and moving in people's lives in the most wonderful and unexpected and glorious ways, and I bless and thank His holy name. Be thankful and rejoice, for our God is the true God. With love, C is the name. That's why I'm in ministry, right there. Letters like that. Thank you. Um, you could send me, you'd say, uh, Brother Brian, would you rather have a million dollars or letters like that? Letters like this every time, every single time. Um, praise the Lord that he saves sinners. Um, really an encouraging letter. Thank you very much for that. And... Uh, <clears throat> if you're out there and you're a sinner and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can get saved. You say, well, I'm too filthy, I'm too rotten, I, you don't understand what I've done. Uh, God understands what you've done. I don't need to understand what you've done. Um, God knows. Uh, you'll be judged by Him. Come to Him as a broken sinner. And He'll save you. Let's go on to the next letter. <clears throat> 